I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we will be having. I'm going to be asking uh, questions, and of course I want you to listen intensely, but uh, I'd also like, we're going to open up the floor towards the end of this for some questions. So please keep those questions in mind so that you can ask and engage the writers in, in some more um, discussion about their work. I, uh, this is a panel about the writer's responsibility, but I'm going to go around that topic right now because what I found most fascinating in the work that they were doing um, was the varied voices that, that I kept approaching with, with, um, with each book and each story. And I'm beginning to think after having read their works that maybe the, the first signal of a writer's responsibility um, or their sense of, of duty to, um, or obligation to what they're doing begins in form. And we have, um, we have writers here that work in fiction, but we also have writers that are working in nonfiction. We have writers here that do both and, and also work, um, write things on blogs and do essays. So I'm going to begin with um, this, uh, this sense that I was reading um, all of their works and, and what kept coming to mind initially was uh, something that I read by Joseph Brodsky in an introduction that he wrote for Danilo Kish's book, A Tomb for Boris Davidovich. And in that introduction, he suggests that it is only through literature that we can begin to comprehend what otherwise numbs our senses or what otherwise seems outside of our grasp or what seems incomprehensible. And having gone through each of your works, I couldn't help but wonder what each of you might, uh, might say about this relationship that he seems to be setting up between the imagination and history, or maybe the imagination and the, and the political. Could you, maybe we'll start with you, Ardian, could you talk a little bit about that, your, your sense of what's the relationship between imagination and, and history? Yes, uh, should I use the microphone? Or use this, is okay. mm, this is fine, okay. Thank you, uh, it, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to be here and uh, to meet these colleagues and uh, friends. And I would like to, to express my gratitude to the organizers of this event for making this possible, because this is a time when we, we talk a lot to each other, but we don't meet that often. And, and this is a, a, a big deal, I think. So now I am happy that some of these uh, colleagues here I, I know. I have even read some of their work. Now I will read more. So maybe this will be an opportunity for us to increase our uh, contacts, even in the virtual world. Now to go back to Maza's question about language and imagination, I will speak from my point of view. As an Albanian writer, which in my case means as a writer in Albanian, which is important because we are like priests of, of a language that we use mainly, and uh, writing in Albanian means to be, to be able to, to use Albanian in order to convey your imagination to others or to help others imagine things that you have imagined too. And uh, in the case of Albanian, I would say that we deal with a language that has been damaged, has been damaged by 50 years of totalitarian dictatorship and uh, by the regimes, the powers, uh, very powerful attempt to control language and to use it for propaganda and uh, in order to manipulate the public so that the public follows uh, whatever their needs and uh, wishes are. So the problem that the writer has now is how to express himself or herself in a way that is not damaged by this shadow that still falls upon the language from the past. So you need somehow to deconstruct your language a little bit and see what's happened and to try to help the reader and to help yourself. This happens at the same time, yourself and the reader, so that you could uh, walk through this fence that the past has built on your language 
and start to communicate directly what you think it should be communicated. And sometimes, I don't want this to sound like uh, I'm playing with words, but what you need to communicate is that we need to think about what we are saying and how we are saying it. So it's a problem of public language. And it is not only confined to nonfiction, because fiction is going to help too with making people aware of their language. Um, okay, I'm going to skip the whole thank you, and I'm so happy to be here um, <laughs> because it's going to make everything long. That kind of um, I just agree with everything you say in that regard. And yes, when it comes to your question, the uh, relation between the imagination and the historical or political, of course, I was t thinking about that, um, you know before I came here, um, because it's kind of, it's interesting to be included in this panel in any way, you know, it's kind of, it is something that I'm kind of torn about, like I, on the one hand, um, I do see myself definitely, um, like, fitting in here, because it is, um, you know, my, my novel is relating a political question in a way, and an ethical question, and, um, and at the same time, I wouldn't call it engaged literature or you know discussing a political question because in the end, the main character is not at all like she pretends in a way to <coughs> to be concerned with uh, these things, but actually she's concerned with herself and with her own um, you know desperation about her own. Um, it's kind of a book about animal ethics and she is actually um, trying to escape society and civilization and is seeing that as a way to, uh, you know, she's kind of identifying with the animals but actually it's all about her and she knows what's good for the animals because she's the one who wants to escape uh, to the wild and she thinks that's good for the animals too and that's totally not the case in, in that case actually. And so I guess, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm kind of torn there because I, like, I would not, I would definitely not limit literature to that at all. I mean, that, that would be really strange and, you know, it can be very, uh, very personal and everything. It doesn't have to be political, obviously. And at the same time, I would say that if it's really engaged literature in the way that it's like writing about other people's problems, yeah. Um, then it kind it feels weird, kind of, yeah. And and that's that that's the kind of literature I would probably not want to write. Like I would rather write about, um, let's say, you know, as a Westerner from a privileged background, whatever. Th you know, there are, there are other issues that are of desperation and concern and so on that are not less grave, I would say. And 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 in in that case. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> I'll leave it there, maybe. <laughs> My turn? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's actually um, uh, quite difficult to avoid uh, thinking about politics if you grew up or have anything to do with Eastern Europe. I don't know, it, does anybody have any example of a um, society who in the last 30 years uh, functioned at least two years without a constitution? <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> Israel doesn't have a constitution. Okay, Romania for two years between December '89 and uh, the fall of '91. It wasn't two full years, but uh, I mean, how can you avoid discussing about politics when you wonder what happens? Uh, you know, every day you kind of uh, go to school, and sometimes you have like steep movements that could have constitutional consequences, and that's serious. So um, it's very hard to ignore this, even if you let's say, study math and you don't care about the real world at all, it's impossible not to notice that the world is changing <coughs> around you. And um, what I actually care about, and uh, this is like something that I'm trying to, to, to identify the right topics to, to, to write about, are uh, the moments when the world changes. But you have to find the right angle to, to capture most of this uh, essential change. Um, like whatever happened in the whole Eastern Europe, how can you say it? How can you find out a story that, you know, while entertaining, pretty much touch the important ideas? And that's actually the, what I've been thinking about most of the time, the last quite a few years. And um, then there are the personal stories. Like when you have somebody who was really close to you and um, something tragic happened, it's impossible you not know, to ignore it and to think about, well, was it an accident, was it a crime? Uh, does it have some political consequences? 
and you figure out that, you know what, the world could have been better. And this is where the story begins. Uh, I'm also very happy to be here and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm practicing journalist and this is the only reason that I write the books. Um, so, uh, and I'm a foreign reporter. All my life, professional life, I've spent in the foreign desk. So uh, all my writing deals with politics. Uh, but I never thought that uh, my duty or my mission, excuse me for this word, is to change the world. Mm -hmm. Um, the only, I'm responsible for the story. And the story is, um, is something that I providing the readers to understand better the surrounding world. It could be our neighbors, but it could be like in my case, very far away countries. Uh, it happened that I covered Africa, uh, Southern Asia, I wrote only one single story about Poland. It was about a Pole who committed the most serious political crime, but in South Africa. Um, it's just happened. Uh, so um, this is about uh, responsibility for the story, mm. to explain the readers uh, in the best possible way what is happening uh, around the world. Uh, I'm responsible for this. Uh, depends on my competence, on the accuracy of the story, uh, but also uh, duty is the form. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, you need different form to say, to tell different stories. Uh, I was searching in every book uh, the best form to tell the story, and uh, I found that uh, talking about Afghanistan, I have to look for different words, because the Afghans are different, Afghan situation and history is different than Polish uh, history and uh, our experience. Uh, but uh, my last book about South Africa is about completely different country and completely different problems and subjects. So I spend <coughs> half my time working on the book, uh, searching for the best, in my opinion, form. So in my opinion, that the form was uh, the best. Uh, this is my limits. Uh, but I consider the story as the most important responsibility for the journalist. If the story is said or written in a bad way, I mean, we will lose the, lead, the, the reader in half of it. So we will not provide everything that we are supposed to provide to the reader. So. That's how I consider form as uh, one of the most important responsibilities for the journalist writers. Thank you. Um, and I, I really would like to talk to um, each of you in more detail about form with, with, uh, with a particular, um, with certain works of yours. But I, um, for now, very quickly, I am reminded of something, Adrian, that you said. Um, in terms of the way that you approached your novel, Bolero, um, you write nonfiction, you, you've written on blogs, but when it came time to, to um, discover or find out the, the, the form for Bolero, when you were um, thinking about that, you realized that there was no other way to do this but through fiction. Can you talk a little bit about that? and? Uh, I think it would be interesting to hear a, a little bit more. What's the difference about writing, let's say, a story that's set in Afghanistan and then a story that's in South Africa? I, that would be really interesting to hear a bit more. Uh, Bogdan, you mentioned we were la Bogdan was making me crack up downstairs because we were talking about the cat that's in your in your book, in the latest book. Um, maybe you can talk about that, the form that, that you chose for that. And uh, Bettina, your background as a philosopher, uh, I wonder what influence it has in your choice to approach. Um, you say that your books are not engaged or your writing is not very engaged, but I have to say that when I was reading it, um, 
what the assertions that you are making, however subtly, are very strong and in some ways could be revolutionary in, in our own understandings of what makes us human. Uh, and I, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. But Ardian, yeah, Bolero and, and Thank fiction. You. I, I, it's really, I appreciate the question because it's, uh, it's a very interesting, very, very interesting question for me. <coughs> I, I've written uh, mostly nonfiction, but also twice I have dared enter into the fictional world. First, chronologically speaking, it's with this novel that it is uh, my last, but it has been part of it has been written a long time ago, and then I have reworked it. And this is this novel about the uh, New York subway. And uh, the problem is the problem. I, I I came in New York in 1996. I settled here in that year, and uh, there were four or five years in which I was surrounded by this incredible world of uh, of metropolis that would speak to me in all kinds of different ways. And this was also the time of my full immersion in uh, English, not only as a language, but also as a culture and uh, as a urban, as a technique of dealing with uh, urban life here, which is quite unlike uh, my life before. Not in Albania, I have used to live in Italy before, but I still cannot compare it to, to what I found in New York. And somehow, all this took the form of the subway. The subway was uh, this being, like almost a mythical being, that was communicating with me and uh, was telling me all these things that I was accumulating, accumulating. And uh, there came a moment that I had somehow to, 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 to tell this thing, to find a way and tell it. And uh, so this is how the novel started. Basically, it was like a a rewriting of all this experience and all these form, different forms of language that the city used to me. Starting from the most uh, trivial of things, you go to the subway and you see that the subway talks to you all the time. The, the public speaking system that uh, says you to go here, that the train are not coming, that this, uh, there is a delay or don't get too close to that. It's giving you orders all the time. It's unbelievable. It's, it's an experience that you can stop and see what is going on. The subway is trying to discipline you in every step. From the moment that you get there, it's really ruthless. The comedy system. <laughs> it is, right? It is. It's, a, it's a mischievous, it's a wicked being that keeps telling you things and you, you are completely powerless. You don't know what to do. You cannot talk back. What do you do? <laughs> really, it's a, there is a voice that talks to you, but you cannot pinpoint the, the origin. And uh, I, I'll take another minute because <laughs> something similar <laughs> happened with my, my second attempt to write non fiction, to write fiction, sorry. Uh, before I had uh, prepared a book about uh, public discourse in Albania during communism, so I had done a lot of research and I have gone through documents of the time, so my brain was kind of you know, like a sponge, was, had, been, had absorbed a lot of these cliches from uh, that kind of a wooden language that we all know, like they speak, <coughs> used to speak. I mean, basically all uh, Eastern European countries more or less had perfected that kind of uh, speech and public discourse. And after reading all this, but this went on for almost two years, and I wrote the book and I still felt that, that I had this voice inside me that talked. It was not mine. It was this voice that came from outside. And I said, I need to, to put this down because it's going to be a unique thing. I, later on, it's going to disappear, this strange voice. So I wrote this book that is almost like a novel. It's not a novel, really. It's a, sh a series of vignettes and short stories. But the, the source of the book was this corpus of totalitarian mm -hmm. thing. And the last thing I'm going to say, uh, Two months ago, we saw a Romanian movie. This was about uh, the black market in the DVDs, and uh, I don't Chuck remember Norris the title yeah. of the movie. Chuck Norris and Communism. Hmm? Chuck Norris and Communism. Yes, Something Chuck Norris and <laughs> Communism. <laughs> this was about the, the black market and the, the piracy, the DVD piracy in Romania under Communism. And among other things in the movie, many of these characters, it was like half documentary, uh, they said that all these movies were not really translated or subtitled, but they were dubbed by a woman that would read the text in Romanian. 
So there was this <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people that were uh, experiencing Western world through the voice of this woman. <laughs> because she would speak in all these movies and they loved her. And they loved her, absolutely. I mean, my, my colleague here would be able to. <laughs> 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 they, they loved her. Uh, I, I deny any rumors. Then. Uh, just go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I mean by uh, voice. Let me translate the joke. This is what President Gorbachev said when it was the first rumor in the Swedish media about the accident in Chernobyl. Well, go ahead. Yeah. So I think this voice, <laughs> this voice, this woman is a voice that I'm pretty sure every Romanian that loved the Western movies they hear it in their head. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's similar to what happened to me in these two cases, with the New York subway and the totalitarian language. You listen to it, it somehow colonizes you, and then you get rid of it by writing a book. So it's like a process that, it's almost like psychoanalysis. I mean, I, I it, you just, yeah. uh, you put it under the spotlight and it will disappear. <laughs>